And again, please mute because uh, any little sound messes up the recording. So, okay. Um, I have quite a few slides to go through and I haven't really timed this out. So I figure it's either going to be 20 minutes or three hours. So at the 20 minute mark, you might want to take a break. Um, you know, I've been in, involved in quite a few different or go through my different phases of photography um, and macro, which I even has now uh, got me uh, going interest in that. Um, and, I, and I've dabbled in infrared photography for many, many years going back in the old uh, film days. When the pandemic hit, you know, there was there was times where we're locked up uh, months on end, really, without going out, doing too much even on my own. And, and this winter, I decided that 2021 would be a year that I get out and photograph on new places. And when I go out, I usually bring one of my uh, infrared cameras along. And so you're going to see a, a few images from um, various locations in Berks County. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, county with, with a lot of uh, uh, availability availability of, of beautiful uh, parks. Um, my goal tonight really is just an overview of infrared photography, the basics, uh, including which cameras and filters to use. Um, I will not be discussing uh, ultraviolet uh, photography, which is kind of on the low end of the, of the, just below the low end of the visible spectrum, which we're going to talk about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the agenda is just a, a brief uh, overview of the of the electromagnetic uh, light spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, um, the uses of infrared, which most of us are familiar with, and various options on how to get into infrared photography without breaking the bank too much. Um, some of the issues that you should be aware of when you do IR photography. And that's the other thing. I'm gonna use the term IR, assume that means infrared. Uh, the light loss when you use external filters, lens issues, uh, hot spots, which when we get to that, that portion, you'll see that's really not a big deal for most lenses. One of the issues that, um, you really do have to be aware of, especially when you look at post-processing is white balance uh, with infrared and the various uh, filters. Uh, my infrared gear, my IR process, I'll say it right now, it, you know, it's like everything else. You, every, each of us has a different workflow for how we process normal pictures. Likewise, I have my workflow for infrared, which doesn't mean that your workflow is any worse. It, matter of fact, it's probably better. I'm kind of in a, a little bit of a, a rut here because I, I feel comfortable now in the workflow I have. We're gonna talk a little bit, well, quite a bit about the different filters. It's important to note that various vendors produce different filters. Most of them will be very close to the ones I have listed here. And for example, 590 uh, nanometers, um, I think two of the vendors call it super color. Another vendor may call it, you know, enhanced. Um, but at any rate, these are the, uh, the, the basic filters uh, that I have and use, and we'll be giving uh, different examples as well as my uh, workflow with them. <clears throat> and then we're gonna talk about, um, comparing the different filters so it becomes obvious to you which one maybe you want to use under different conditions there are a couple of charts here that i have uh, from uh, Kalari vision uh, and i have their permission to use them now before i actually get into uh, the details uh, you know there, there's probably many of you or at least some of you uh, really don't know what an infrared uh, image looks like um, so I'm going to go through just a, a couple of quick examples. And this is really one that um, I, I use quite often. It's at the Berks Heritage Center, which is one of my favorite places to go for a walk. 
the building there is the Gruber Wagon Works. That is a yellow building and the trees are green. They aren't white. Um, but I kind of like the, uh, the IR version of, of this with the white trees. I'll probably go back in the fall and see what I can get creative when the leaves actually turn. Um, and I'll say right now, I, I usually like the, the more subtle colors in infrared, although I will show you a couple of uh, eye popping uh, images as well. This is the same image, same exact image, same file, where I was able to duplicate the Kodak Aerochrome uh, IR film simulation. Um, but 20 years ago, I believe, Kodak actually discontinued uh, the Aerochrome uh, film. I did look it up on eBay and found a roll for uh, about $80 per roll. So uh, I'm not getting back into uh, IR film at all, but um, you know, it goes way back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, I could, some people really like the more subtle um, shades of IR, uh, sometimes the robustness of the reds uh, kind of really uh, stands out. This is an IR image. Um, I don't do a lot of IR photography with people. Um, I mainly like, um, you know, landscapes and cityscapes, but um, it just, I'll say it again, probably a couple of times when I can't get a color right and I like the image, I'll convert it to black and white. Uh, and sometimes they turn out nice. Um, as uh, Ivan and Ken know, it's uh, very easy to create junk <laughs> out of uh, infrared photography. Um, so, um, <sighs> As I mentioned, I went out in January and February. Uh, a lot of times there was nobody else in the parks. It was cold, chilly. Um, and most of the time, the landscape in the winter is kind of blah. Um, but I was walking around the pond at uh, Angora Farm. I liked the uh, composition I could get. And so with my IR uh, camera and the 590 filter, I was able to bring out some pretty pretty good uh, red colors. And, um, you know, even with IR, you still have to look at getting your exposure right and uh, nail your composition. Because in post-processing, you're more worried about getting the colors right. Um, and, and it'd be nice if, you know, get your composition and exposure right the first time right out of the camera. So I walked to the other side of the pond <clears throat> and got this image, uh, which again, um, I, I like the more subtle golden colors. Those are green pine trees. They aren't the, the goldenrod color. Uh, the pond was slightly covered. It was just a good day. I felt really awesome coming out of that, that walk that day. Now this image is back at the uh, Berks Heritage Center, the uh, Epler School. Um, I processed it and uh, blurred the entire picture, which, you know, <laughs> there's so many options you, you, can, you can use. A lot of times I'll get to my final stage of processing and I'll do something that may wreck the image. Here's one where it's a toss up whether I leave it as a sharp image or, or blur it. Again, I guess it depends on, on the uh, mood I'm in. Ivan and I went to um, York, uh, Pennsylvania uh, in the spring to photograph uh, the egrets um, at uh, the Kiwanis Lake. Again, I had my uh, IR camera with me and uh, there's a little park uh, next to the lake, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, I, I kind of like, I could visualize this being an IR uh, image and was quite pleased when I got home and was able to process it like this. Now, some will say that the grass wasn't brown. No, the grass was really green and the trees were green. Um, but, um, you know, to, to me, I, I kind of liked that image. Okay, so now we're going to come up 
with a, a series of screens or uh, slides that kind of give a high level overview of the uh, electromagnetic uh, spectrum and specifically looking at how narrow the visible light portion of that is. You know, down at the, uh, the low end, like around uh, 380 nanometers. So when you see NM, that is really a nanometer, one billionth. <clears throat> and up at the high end is 780 uh, for red and next to it and kind of actually overlapping it um, is the uh, what's called near infrared uh, rays frequency. Um, just another way to visualize it. And, and I like this chart because when we start talking about the filters, you'll be able to see in your head which colors are actually blocked out. The IR filters block certain frequent certain wavelengths i'm sorry i said frequency i meant wavelength so for example if i have a 590 filter i'm blocking out yellow green blue violet um, and only lets through the 590 and and up <clears throat> okay so this is the one you're going to have a quiz on at the end We're really talking, you have the wavelengths, the 580, the 380, 470. You have the frequency, and the wavelength is the distance between two points in successive waves. The frequency, which is the number of waves that pass a point in space during a specific time. And the overall energy is related to the frequency. <clears throat> Violet has the most energy and, and red the least. And was a surprising to me, and I guess I hadn't really thought about it, that visible light occupies only one thousandth of a percent of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. Um, and when we, we look at that spectrum, you know, with the um, energy given off by uh, gamma, you definitely don't want to do uh, gamma. But on the other end, you have, you know, your radio, radio waves, microwave, uh, infrared So most of us, I assume, are familiar with some of the basic uh, uses of uh, infrared. It's a, a thermal radiation. You really don't see it, but if anybody's used a, uh, uh, one of those portable IR uh, heaters, you can, you can feel the heat, but you can't really see it. Uh, night vision uh, cameras, I have a security camera with IR uh, tracking, heat-seeking missiles. Most of us don't have a need for that. Uh, meteorology, weather satellites, TV remotes. The um, frequency for the remote is just above the visible light. Uh, thermography, uh, heating I mentioned, and uh, I'm sure there's many other uh, uses for IR, um, but tonight we're just talking about the uh, infrared photography. <clears throat> so, there's quite a few different ways to get into infrared photography. The easiest and the one that I used when I first started was take my current camera and use an external filter with it. It's the most cost effective. It cuts out visible light up to the wavelength of the filter. So for example, again, if I have a 590 filter, it's gonna cut out all of the light below that frequency. Um, when I first started, I used a, uh, a black and white filter around an 850. It's, it's like using a very strong neutral density filter. It's, you, you have to focus, manual focus ahead of time, kind of calculate the exposure that you're gonna need or do a trial and error. And definitely you're gonna need a tripod and static uh, subjects, um, except you can get some really cool images, just like you can with neutral density filters of um, motion, you know, uh, blurred water, blurred skies, etc. Option two, now I've done this one. I've actually done it twice. Uh, you send in a camera for conversion. 
they replace the low pass filter in front of the sensor with an IR filter, and it cuts out the portion of the visible light spectrum. And you actually have to decide ahead of time which level, which frequency you would like uh, to have it converted to. Um, it's much more sensitive to IR light because it doesn't block out the IR frequency anymore. You're able to hand hold it most of the time. Again, just like with your regular camera, you're going to have times where you might have to get slower shutter speed. You're able to use autofocus, no tripod required. It's rather expensive. I guess that's relative. The, the two I had converted, when, one was 275 and the other was 250. But then your camera is dedicated to IR uh, photography with an exceptional talk about. I call that two-way because you're still sending it in for a, a, a conversion. But there is an option where you can send it in for a full spectrum. Uh, it lets the entire light spectrum pass from ultraviolet through uh, infrared. And yes, it is the most flexible. However, you're going to have you have to use external filters, which can be expensive because most of the filters, like um, I have a, several 77 millimeter filters, uh, were probably about 140 to 160 dollars a piece. And you can use that converted camera. Uh, the full spectrum by adding what as a normal camera by adding a UV cut filter uh, to the to the lens. But um, my understanding is that it is not uh, as good as a normal camera would be. Another option, which I believe uh, Ken uh, Martin used was to purchase a converted camera. All of the major vendors uh, have an option uh, for a purchase of a camera from a point and shoot, which is a great way to get into it, all the way up to you know a, a five thousand uh, dollar model. Um, I've listed links to two of the companies I'm familiar with, uh, Life Pixel and Kawari Vision. There are other vendors. I'm not pushing these. I have no relationship uh, to either company. I've used both and very satisfied and just haven't uh, worked uh, much uh, with, with other companies. Um, and these two are very uh, reputable. Okay, so let's go back real quick. So you can use an external filter with your current camera. There are obstacles. I was frustrated going that route at first with IR because, um, you know, you have to wait. <laughs> you have to, yeah, it's trial and error. And you aren't going to get any uh, ability to autofocus. And um, also the conversion, which to me was the right way to go. One of my cameras, in fact, was converted to a 590 and the other to a full spectrum, which there was <laughs> situations there that if I had to do it over again, I probably would not have gone with the full spectrum. Uh, the reason I went with that is I had a very old uh, camera body uh, and I already had one to 590 and I was looking at getting a, uh, a 470 uh, filter. So with an IR filter on your regular camera, which I've already mentioned, with a 720 filter, and a lot of companies and people call the 720 filter a standard IR filter, you could lose up to 10, 10 stops of uh, light loss, long exposure and a tripod required. With an 850, I mean, it's, it's looking, you know, it looked pure black when you look through the... Uh, uh, you know, through the camera, uh, 15 stops or more. Uh, again, reiterate, it's like using a very strong neutral density filter, manual focus. You have to get your proper exposure, then exposure, exposure based on your filter and trial and error. And I think once you, you, you know, you used it a few times, you know, um, almost you can calculate what your uh, new exposure should be. 
Now, light loss using a converted camera, the 590 filter, there's actually a slight gain in exposure. A 720 filter, it's very similar to just using your regular camera. And uh, 850, I, I put down one to three stop loss. I was out the other day and I, it was certainly more than uh, three stops, but um, you can still use it uh, in, um, you know, auto, auto focus. Okay. Um, if you do a Excuse lot me, of Bill. research on infrared photography, Bill, they will. Yep. Excuse me. Um, one question was asked and um, I think we have the answer and that is um, where would one go to get a camera converted using, would you send it to one of the two companies you mentioned or can you bring it to a local camera store to get done? No, the, the local camera store may or may not be able, like Cardinal Camera and Effort, uh, I'm not sure um, uh, you know, if they would do it. I would certainly check with them because I prefer to do local, uh, but I had these converted prior to, uh, uh, to going. You know, here again, it's, it's, I'm not pushing either of these companies. I'm just very familiar with them. And if you look up, you know, you Google uh, uh, infrared photography, you know, you're going to, they probably pay for it. You'll see their ads pop up. Uh, the, the two sites, uh, Kalari and um, um, Light Pixel, have excellent tutorials on their sites. They have excellent uh, examples of which filters do what. Uh, and if, if you have an interest in IR after this, really suggest going to those sites as well as, as, well as others. So when you, you buy them directly from the manufacturer, for example, could you go to Canon and say, sell me an infrared camera? Pardon me, you can, you go, do, you know. Do the companies produce these yeah. um, direct, like this Canon and Fuji, do they? Do they make it? They, uh, if you look at, uh, I think both of these, you, you go to their site, you look up, um, uh, you know, cameras to buy, and they will have all the major brands, Canon, Fuji, Sony, can, you know, all of them, or most all of them, and they will have them from the uh, point and shoot all the way through the, uh, the, the high end. So you, you, you know, just deal with them directly. Thank you. So, one of the things you should be aware of, and, and sometimes it's an issue and mo a lot of times it's not, is that lenses are produced for optimal, optimal performance uh, when photographing invisible light. Um, whereas infrared performance is not predictable. When I say performance, some lenses lend themselves to hotspots. Um, it, it's a visible circular area and depending where it is, uh, you can correct it a lot of times in post-processing. Um, there are a lot of, in, there's a lot of information available for listing uh, various lenses that are conducive to hotspots. I have a 10 to 24. I, I love that range. Um, and it will produce a hotspot, but, but sometimes I want to use it for a, a wider angle uh, shot and try to compose the image such that I know I can clone it or, uh, you know, smooth over the, over the hotspot. And I'll have an example coming up. Just a couple of references for you. Um, did, I'm not sure if I mentioned, I'm going to go back here a little. Um, I will have copies of this presentation available on PDF and a link to my uh, infrared uh, photo gallery uh, available. There'll be a, a, a links at the end of the presentation. Okay, so here's an article. I've been in touch with this Joel Wolfson. It's, it's a fairly high level uh, article, uh, but he does a good job explaining how to choose your best lenses for I IR photography. And unless you're really, really into IR photography, I wouldn't look at buying specific lenses uh, for IR photography, but using the lenses you have. Uh, Kalari and Life Pixel uh, both have uh, hotspot databases that you can go into. And again, there's the, the links uh, to that. Okay. Um, 
here's hotspot examples uh, with my 10 to 24. Um, these images were not converted yet, but um, pretty much coming out of the camera. The top image, you can see right there, dab in the center of the image, a very faint uh, hotspot. Normally, the hotspots are affected by which f-stop you're using. I was a little surprised this time in that the more obvious hotspot shown on the um, bottom image were actually affected more by uh, which focal length I was using and uh, not so much on the uh, on the f-stop. Um, okay, so... This is called my break the monotony of too many text slides screen. Um, <laughs> you know, as I mentioned, there are just so many wonderful places in Berks County. Up on the left hand side, that is uh, Quersonia uh, Lake. Uh, Ivan and I have walked that a, a couple of times. Uh, to me, I, I kind of like this image: the subtle, uh, the blues in the in the sky, the um, light tannish orange of the trees and the dark blue of the lake over on the right hand side uh, where the uh, the ducks waiting to go in the water the bottom left uh, is another beautiful place to walk around that's the stone house at uh, Wyomissing. I went there in the uh, the winter before it froze over but you can see the trees were you know bare um but there's a few pine trees that I was able to pull out some of the uh, uh, the orange. And the house on the bottom right is just the house. I have a pad, drove by, stopped, took a quick picture, got home, and I, I kind of like the uh, you know the, the, the contrast of the of the various colors. And again, depending on what filter you're using, you might be able to pull out some of the some of the greens like I was in the. Uh, in that uh, tree on the left that was hanging down. A challenge for me and probably for many is to get a sky color that I like. Um, a lot of times I will actually give up and just convert it to black and white. You know, there's the train station uh, at the outer station in, in Reading in Muhlenberg. I was actually just stuck the camera out of the car while I'm waiting at the light. I, I don't like the sky. Um, I, again, I try to get kind of a, a close to a bluish sky as I can. Um, the image on the right is over at the Angora Fruit Farm, which is now part of the Berks County uh, Park System. Just something about the simplicity of, of that one I, I liked. And uh, bottom left was Old Dry Road, uh, old dry road uh, Farm out um off of um oh what's the name it's not driveville i can't think of the name of the road in uh, northern berks so that's my break the monotony um images a lot of uh interesting uh discussions about white balance um i shoot raw <clears throat> for various reasons, again, which I'll, we'll talk about. But that is not to say that you can't get excellent JPEG images. Um, I recommend that you set a, a custom white balance in the camera. If you're using a 720 and 850, you can shoot the, uh, the green foliage, uh, the, uh, the grass, a tree for uh, 850 images. I just often wait and use the white clouds in post-processing. Um, for the fill, like the 590 and 470 filters, I'll use a uh, shoot a test uh, gray white card and quite often we'll set a custom white balance. But 90% of the time, even with a customer custom white balance, I'll adjust it in post as well. Um, again, I'm gonna refer you, there's a lot of tutorials, a lot of discussions about white balance, and especially for JPEGs, it's really, really important. JPEG, JPEGs, you have your white balance, you know, basically cooked into the, uh, the image, whereas raw, you just have much more flexibility. I will shoot an image in raw. I'll bring it into my raw processor. 
Uh, you know, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And I typically will create multiple versions of that image using uh, different white balances, depending on what I'm thinking I want for a, uh, a resulting uh, image. <clears throat> Excuse me. Quick drink here. Okay. Um, I have two cameras that were converted. Uh, the X, Fuji X-T1 was converted to 590 nanometers and my X-E1 was converted to full spectrum. Uh, that camera was basically almost zero value when I was gonna have it. I was you know, not using it. Um, it had some issues um, with, with a sensor and I decided, oh gee, infrared photography is so much fun. I'm gonna have one converted to full spectrum and then I can get all the filters I want until I started seeing that filters for some of the lenses I want we're going to use were pretty expensive. Um, the, as I mentioned, the full spectrum re definitely requires external filters. So I have a 470, what LifePixel calls a hyper color. I have a 665 enhanced IR and really a bummer. I lost that at Daniel Boone Homestead in the winter. Uh, when I was walking around with a heavy winter coat, uh, trying to get it in my, my uh, pocket. I haven't decided if I'm going to buy another one or not, because right now I use the 590 a lot. Um, I also have a 720, which a lot of people call the standard IR, and a 850, uh, deep black and white. Um, all four filters can be used in the full spectrum camera, but only... The 665, 720, and 850 can use on the um, X-T1 because the X-T1 is 590. Sure, I could put the 470 on the 590, uh, the X-T1, but it will do no good because the 590 is cutting out the filters, the frequencies, sorry, the wavelengths below 590. If I was to do it all over again, I, uh, again, my personal preferences and the colors I like, I would go with a 590 conversion and one external filter, the 850. However, the 665 was fun. And the 470, I'll, I'll show you, you can get some pretty wild colors uh, with that. So um, my infrared process, uh, my workflow, I shoot raw. Uh, again, it's not necessary, but recommended. There are just much more flexibility in post-processing. And JPEG is okay if you can set a, uh, a good white balance. Um, I could use just Photoshop to, to do all the processing. I use Capture One, C1, for uh, all my uh, raw processing. Uh, and there's other raw programs, you know, just as well. On One, um, Photoshop, um, and again, depending on which filter I'm using, I may output a JPEG into Photoshop. Uh, yes, it's extra work, but Capture One does not currently have a good way to what's called do a channel swap. And when I talk about a channel swap, it's taking the red channel and the blue channel and basically swapping uh, their settings. I also do a lot in Photoshop playing with the uh, channel mixer and the uh, hue and saturation and or the NIK and the Nick Color Effects uh, Pro. Uh, there are other uh, programs that can also do the, uh, the, the channel swap. Warning, if you, if you get into infrared photography, it is very, very easy to spend way too much time in the digital darkroom. Uh, as I mentioned, I like to do multiple versions of, of one uh, image. Um, and, you know, before you know it, I've killed a couple of hours and may not even have a, uh, an image that I like. Just to uh, recap, uh, what does a filter cut out? So when you look at a, a 470 filter, you're cutting out all the violet and some of the blue. You know, and again, it's not like when you go from 495, 
it's not like you go to 496 and you might not have any blue in there. There's there's overlap between the uh, the wavelengths. Uh, 590 cuts out the violet, blue, green, and yellow, and 720 most of the entire visible light spectrum. Some red is left. I actually do like the 720 in the in the subtle colors that you, you can uh, get out of it, and then the uh, 850. It just typically not typically it is just black and white it's also the filter that i can use to get the most dynamic um uh, dynamic looking images out of so what i'm going to do now is just go th real quickly through the different filters um this is these are strips from um Kalari vision to show, okay, here's the 470 filter, and they have this chart for each one. It will show what, if you set a custom white balance, what it's going to look like in the camera, what it's going to look like if you do a channel swap, the red and blue channels. Here's what it's going to look like with black and white. And here's what it's going to look like if you just leave your camera on uh, auto white balance. And again, the note down below, not all companies offer hypercolor. The uh, one I have is from Life Pixel. Uh, Kalari Vision also has a couple of very specialized uh, filters. Uh, can't remember the name of the one. Um, it will actually produce um, the look of a 590 with the channels converted uh, straight out of the camera. Uh, but again, that one was probably closer to $200. Oh, okay. So <laughs> hypercolor, that's uh, hypercolor. Uh, this is just a, a lot of times I just go out in front of my house and take pictures of the neighborhood to see what I'm going to come up with. You know, you can get some pretty wild colors. This was taken with the, the, the full spectrum. Again, because I could not use my 470 on my other converted camera because that was a 590. Uh, you know, it's I'll go out in my deck and take pictures of the, of the back, or I'll go out in the front and uh, you know, see what I can get. Uh, I, I assure you that the road in front of my house is not green, and my neighbor's trees are not purplish. This is looking uh, the other uh, the other direction. I could, in Photoshop, use the channel mixer and hue and saturation in Photoshop uh, to create different versions uh, of this. But again, you can spend a lot of time um, playing. This is the 590 Super Color. This is probably my most used uh, filter. Again, showing off to the right, if you, if you don't set your white balance, um, that's what it's going to look like uh, in the uh, in the camera and off on the left, uh, which is using a custom white balance. Now, I'll say it again, but shooting raw and I don't know how it would work on JPEG, but I could take my my raw image and I wouldn't have to use a, a custom white balance as long as there was something I could use the white balance picker on to set a white balance for me to start with. A lot of times I will just use a uh, uh, white fluffy cloud and set the white balance that way. <clears throat> it's um, you get super vibrant fo uh, foliage, a uh, nice colorful sky. I usually swap the red and blue channels for the golden tones. Um, 590 creates some very interesting images straight out without having uh, to do the the swap of the of the red and uh, blue channels, and it's also quite good to convert to black and white. Uh, and it's, in my opinion, the most flexible for uh, when I come into post processing. Okay, this is down at uh, Grings Mill. Um, I, you know, I had the. Uh, image into uh, Capture One. This is what it came out of my raw processing before I did the channel swap. Now, you know, for an IR image, that by itself is pretty good. I could probably tweak the blue a little in, uh, in Photoshop. But what I did then in Photoshop was just swap the uh, red and blue channel and I increased the saturation. You know, if I had been in a, you know, different mood that day, I probably would have uh, toned down the saturation. So here it's coming into Photoshop after the channel swap. 
Um, I didn't do much other processing on that one at all. Out in uh, Northern um, Burn Township, um, there's a church for the, the, the graveyard. Um, I saw this one more of, I wonder what it would look like in uh, black and white, <clears throat> excuse me. So that's before the channel swap coming out of my raw processor and pretty dramatic converting it uh, to, to black and white. With the 590 converting to black and white, quite often I'll uh, do levels um, and reset uh, the black and, and white uh, points. You can kind of see by the, uh, the trees in the bottom right hand uh, side, uh, the, the sun was kind of peeking through the clouds. I, I kind of like, uh, kind of like this image. Another 590 example. Uh, this is down at the Heritage Center again. That's a yellow building. I've said it before. I'll probably say it again. I, I'm, I'm more attuned to having the more subtle uh, colors in my uh, IR image. Um, I probably have, I don't know, at least 100 pictures of the wagon works from this vantage point. A lot of them with the uh, with the regular camera, but also quite a few um, images taken with the uh, with the infrared. A lot of times, what I'll do too is is months later, or even going back a year later, and and reprocess some of the images um, I've worked on before. Um, again, depending on what I'm looking for as a resulting image. This is the same one. Um, really a dramatic look. Um, it's probably a little too dark, but that was my, what I was looking for on that day. <clears throat> I probably overused the blur in uh, Photoshop uh, or in Color Effects Pro. Um, but again, I sometimes enjoy just making multiple versions of the same image. Uh, this is the spillway uh, off of uh, Highway 73 uh, between Leesport and Blandon. Um, Ivan and I have been there a couple of times. It's, it's really a nice place to walk around and you can get some excellent uh, shots. This is the one I, I lost, the 665 Enhanced IR. Um, again, just showing you, like if you look at it's more of a muted sky. The colors are not as vibrant on the foliage as the 590. There's less contract, contrast on the black and white. But you can get some pretty cool uh, images. Okay, this is the output from my raw converter before I've done any messing around in Photoshop with it. This is from uh, actually my uh, front yard. And then this is the color adjusted in Photoshop with a channel swap. Um, I probably played around with hue and saturation and or uh, the channel mixer. Um, you know, one may hate this image, one may like this image. Uh, that's the one thing you're gonna find out with, uh, uh, with uh, infrared. Um, you can, again, depending on a person's taste, uh, you may like it or may hate it. <coughs> Excuse me, another quick. So <clears throat> here is with a 720, which uh, most people call uh, the um, a standard uh, IR. It's equivalent to the Hoy R72 or Ratten 89B uh, filter. Um, you can see that there's quite you know, much less color coming through. It's got a good tonal range on the black and white. Um, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good to be doing channel swaps with a 720 uh, filter. Um, there's just not that much information in those channels. This is actually one of my favorite you know, images, although I, I go back and forth with the uh, with the sky on this one. Uh, that little building there, uh, this again, this is at the Heritage Center. That building is red. It's not 
green or turquoise so whatever color it's showing up um i kind of like the mix between the uh the white trees and the you know bit of reddish uh coming through uh this is with a 720 and I, and i really should get out more uh with the 720 uh usually when i go out and i throw an ir camera and it's the 590 and sometimes i forget just to bring um my other filters with me okay this one i i don't like um i i struggled getting a better color in the sky and i i realized that i could spend a lot more time and do more masking um capture one does have the ability to do um masking as this photoshop um but you, you know you reach a point where am i taking these ir images because i like working in photoshop and capture one or am i messing with uh, or taking ir images uh because of the, the the challenge and and trying to get a look that i i would like to achieve which i usually do when i take a photo i'm thinking in my head okay do i want something really vibrant um or do i want some more subtle colors with the picture i took showed you previously on the uh, pond at Ang angora um because it was in the dead of winter i really wanted a much more vibrant colors uh coming out of it and again i'm going to reiterate you know you got to get your composition and uh exposure uh right in camera um i will probably come back to this one uh and and work on it so as well as this one you know this is another one i converted to black and white because i couldn't get the colors right but it to me it's too dark um i'll go back and and uh, fix this one up and then a filter that i don't use a lot but i really shouldn't i like it because whenever i see white fluffy clouds it be a perfect day for uh, for this it's great black and white straight out of the camera so if you're shooting jpeg you really don't have to do much uh with the images from this filter you could uh, maybe adjust levels a little bit uh setting the black and, and white points you see that the custom white balance doesn't do a lot of good the channel swaps no good and your auto white balance you're still going to see the perp the pinkish image um in your in the camera i i like the simplicity of this shot uh it's converted from raw i mentioned 850 loves white clouds i think with this one i just shot set the white uh point on one of the clouds and uh you know just again framed it um when what i was looking for this is and for those who don't know that's the epler school uh was moved from its original location in burn township to the heritage center uh last year this is the disselfink at the uh, heritage center that is a very bright uh bird with uh, reds and blues and yellows and the entire spectrum but in uh, black and white it's still quite uh quite appealing at least in my opinion okay this is one that um i don't do a lot of what i'll call like abstract photos to me this is kind of abstract this was 850 and all i did was set white points and and uh black points to the levels and um i, I kind of like this image um i could just sit here and and look at each branch for a while okay so i basically went through the, the the filters what i'd like to do is spend just a few minutes <coughs> excuse me going through before and after processing and showing you differences on uh what i'm doing with uh with the white balance these are just images from my uh, uh front yard um uh, you know it's not like some fantastic uh, uh landscape uh image up in yellowstone but um so went out this is you know normal normal picture a gray road green grass green trees nice sky with some white clouds i set a custom white balance 
this is the hyper color out. This is the 470 hyper color with a white balance of 4978 with a custom white balance in the camera with my full spectrum for the 470. For, um, so after processing, notice that the white balance dropped from 4978 to 2675 and the tint adjusted slightly. And all I did was use a white picker on uh, uh, the, the white, <laughs> excuse me, the white balance picker on uh, the white clouds. I didn't do anything else to this one. And I ended up with the, uh, the purplish trees, which again, I don't think they exist in real life, but um, you know, kind of a un unique image. And I didn't do any other processing with the hue and saturation. So this is the 590 straight out of the camera, uh, custom white balance. Uh, white balance is 2595 taken with my converted camera, the 590. And I dropped the white balance by selecting the clouds to um, 1031. No external filters, because I don't need it with a converted camera. And then I did a, a channel swap, the red and blue channels. And you know, swapping the channels, um, the, the vendors will produce, give you actions to do it. There's also multiple, many different uh, tutorials on, uh, on YouTube about uh, doing channel swaps, not just with Photoshop, but with other uh, software as well. Okay, so I took this image and just, I call it playing around with the channel mixer. Uh, guarantee if you start into this stuff, you know, you're going to, you'll, you'll be experimenting, uh, flipping around different channels, playing with the different colors, the different, uh, you know, uh, in the channel mixer or the hue. And there she is, the red one, the aerochrome, after more playing uh, with a channel mixer. As I said, you, you can end up with quite a few different uh, versions of the, uh, the same image. Um, this is the uh, 590. I did the channel shop, swap in Photoshop and slight adjust, adjustments in the uh, hue and saturation. That's again, looking down the street, I was able to get the, the kind of grayish road um, and, the, and the sky isn't uh, too bad on this one. Um, you know, I, I, I love going out when the clouds are like this. Okay, this is 720 out of the, out of the, uh, out of the camera. Uh, the balance is 2595. I set the custom white balance and I'm using my 590 with the 720 uh, external filter. I could have used my, uh, ex my full spectrum camera with the external uh, 720. Uh, but this camera is a, a 24 megapixel and the other one is 12. So I, after I chose the white balance, notice it only went down to 2510. It was 2595. So not much, much of a difference, slight decrease in the white balance. And then when I did a channel swap, much less uh, vibrant colors out of... Uh, from the 590. And I have to say though, why I mentioned that 590, probably my favorite, I can actually, you know, in, in my raw processing, I, I don't have to be able to create the uh, vibrant golden colors that uh, are produced through the channel swap. Um, I don't particularly like this uh, image, uh, but I just showed you a conversion to, uh, to black and white uh, with my, uh, 590 converted camera with an external 720. Then the 850, the 850 loves fluffy white clouds. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I really like the, uh, the, the contrast. It's again, I, ideal if you're going to only shoot JPEGs. Um, on this, I, I think I probably just did some minor tweaks uh, to, to levels. Um, if I 
tried to take this image with a regular camera with an external 850. I'd be setting up the tripod. I'd probably be exposing for exposure for a long time. I don't even want to guess, but probably a minute. Uh, and you would see the, you know, the blur in the clouds, which again can be very, very uh, nice looking. Um, but um, with the uh, with the converted camera, uh, you just can use it like a uh, normal camera. Uh, this is over at the uh, Stilling Basin. Um, I go over there quite often just to see if I can get pictures of my long lens of the the heron. And if you look at the down in the bottom right bank, you can see the heron. And unfortunately, I didn't have my uh, my long lens with me that day or a regular camera. This one I don't like. This is one of those that uh, this is over by the the, the prison um, in Burn Township. Uh, there's a little pond there. I, I drive by. I don't. It's not the easiest place to park and and take a picture of the pond. So I stuck the camera out the window. Nobody was in back of me and nobody coming towards me and uh, took this uh, picture. Uh, I like it better uh, without the, <clears throat> excuse me, intentional blur I did. Um, and again, because I have the raw file, I'll I go back and and uh, work on it. And by the way, I um, my uh, success ratio is increasing. Uh, I can produce junk images very easily, and that number is reducing the more experience I get. Okay, just a, a few recommendations if you get into uh, IR photography. Just like uh, with your uh, neutral density filters, buy the largest for the, fil the filter size for the lenses that you will be using. Uh, and then you step up rings if you're using uh, lenses that are uh, don't have quite the same uh, filter size. Uh, my largest uh, filter I have size, I, I have a 77, and then I have the uh, step up rings uh, if I use other lenses. If you have a lens that has a hot spot issue, just try using different f-stops. Uh, it may go away, or uh, you perhaps uh, it will reduce so much that you aren't going to see it anyway. And when you're taking landscape, a lot of times the, the center portion of your image is uh, maybe in the trees. It's not necessarily in the sky where you're going to uh, where it's going to be noticeable. Um, and so I really wouldn't make that a, a hot spots a big issue. I just wanted it to bring it to your attention. Uh, experiment. And this is one I do a lot of. Um, try different white balance settings and processing techniques. Uh, I'm sure each of you have your own way of uh, creating a, a unique image from your, your regular images. It same, same applies to uh, IR. Uh, but again, I don't want to hear from you when you're spending hours in the uh, uh, digital darkroom working on uh, IR images. If you're shooting raw, set your camera to black and white uh, color, uh, black and white. Uh, it, it's much easier to compose and focus uh, through the viewfinder instead of looking at a, a pink or pinkish violet uh, image. Um, of course, that's not true when you're going to shoot JPEG. You're, otherwise, you will end up with a black and white JPEG image. Document your process. I learned the hard way. I would go through various experiments uh, in Capture One, my raw processor, and or Photoshop uh, to get an image. And, I, you know, it's, oh, wow, I really like this. And I didn't write down the steps to get there. And it might have been, you know, five, six different things that I've, I've tweaked, hue and saturation or a channel mixer or something in, uh, in my raw processor. There's, I've developed uh, certain what's called styles uh, in uh, Capture One that I, that I can apply that cuts out quite, it's like almost like an action Photoshop. It just cuts down a lot of the time. And then, Share your images. Um, 
you know, Ivan and I and uh, Ken and I have shared our uh, IR image to get uh, feedback uh, from each other. There's also several infrared groups on uh, on Facebook. There's an international one. Uh, you can see what other people are doing. Uh, just like regular uh, photography, you, you want to follow somebody that um, you like what they're producing and, and what their workflow is. And, um, you know, the uh, infrared groups on uh, Facebook have been uh, inspirational, quite honestly, to, to me. Uh, and the vendor sites like Pixel and Kalari and others have uh, user galleries, uh, which is um really a good source to get some inspiration i believe one at least one of them has a uh, drop down where you can uh, select by which filter they've used or uh, which camera and my you know most recommended recommendation is to have fun um don't get discouraged if you can't produce something what you consider to be worthwhile sharing um, right out of right out you know as soon as you get into IR photography it, it's I, I've spent hours and hours and hours um, uh, in you know in my raw processor in, in Photoshop uh, trying to get images that are unique and yet something that I like I, I do IR photography for me I'm not doing it uh, because I want to impress somebody on uh, uh, Facebook. Okay, so <clears throat> I will also put these links in the chat room when we're done here. The uh, This presentation in PDF format, there's uh, my IR gallery. And if you have questions, there's my, uh, my uh, email. Unfortunately, when I start building my uh, IR photo gallery, I didn't document which filter, which camera, I uh, apologize for that. And hopefully you can look at it and, and get uh, some uh, in inspiration uh, from that. So are we three hours up yet? You're right on target, Bill. Superb. 